Good evening, everybody. This is Mike Cooper at Calvary Chapel, Dawbell, and we're back here again for our Wednesday night study. We're currently in Proverbs 31, and we've gone through verses 1 through 9, so tonight we'll be starting with verse 10, 10 through 31. And um, this is about the virtuous woman and how to find her. Uh, we'll try to get through verse 17 tonight. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, once again for bringing us here. Even though we're online, Lord, we know that you're with us and that you're guiding us, Lord. And that's what I pray for, Lord, that you take this from me and speak to your people. Father, you teach them. You give them the words that they need to hear, Lord, and, and uh, put on their hearts what they need in their hearts. So we thank you for this time here. We pray that you walk among us here, Lord. Even though we're online, we know that you alone are capable of that, and that we do pray for your presence. So we love you, Lord, and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, verse 10. Who can find a virtuous wife? For her worth is far above rubies. <clears throat> the term virtuous here means a woman of strength, and what it is referring to is strength of character, such as the fear of God, or men of truth, or hating covetousness. In light of this verse, we can say that the virtuous man is one who fears God, loves truth, and hates sin. Moses was told to find able men many men of strength that fear God, love the truth, and hate sin. And the implication is that men like this were hard to find. The expression is also used in 1 Kings 1.42, where it says a valiant man or man of strength. With the opposite of that in 1 Kings 1.52, where it says a man of wickedness is found. So a virtuous man is a man of great moral strength in whom wickedness is not found. He is a godly, God-fearing man. So also, the virtuous woman is a God-fearing woman. You also see that in this chapter when you compare verse 1 here with verse 30, where it says, Charm is deceitful and beauty is passing, but a woman who fears the Lord shall be praised. This is found in two other places in the Bible. One is Ruth 3, 11, where, where everyone in a city knew that she was a virtuous woman. When a woman has strength of character, fears God, loves truth, hates sin, then others can see and recognize this. It is a very virtuous or obvious virtuous woman because it is very unusual. You don't see this often. People are usually so morally weak, morally weak in character that when a man or a woman of, of strength shows up, it's really evident to everybody. The other place where the term is used in Proverbs 12:4, where we learn that a virtuous woman doesn't make her husband ashamed. Then in part B here, for her worth is far better than rubies or far above rubies. She is far more valuable and worth more than rubies. Her Hebrew, the Hebrew term here for rubies may refer to rubies, but may refer to pink pearls or red coral. The pink pearl, which is found as a mollusk, and a mollusk in the Red Sea, was considered to be of great value to in those times. It's difficult to know exactly which stone or pearl this Hebrew word referred to, but its usage in the Old Testament tells us two things for sure. One, it was very valuable. You can see that in Proverbs 20.15 and Job 28.18. And two, it was reddish in color, where it says in Lamentations 4.7, ruddy, which is red in color. Who can find a virtuous woman, a woman of strength? She is like a rare gem. Precious stones are precious and costly because they are so rare. You know, if you could go out along the roadside and just pick up all of them that you want to, they wouldn't be rare, would they? 
It is, it is the rare, hard to find gems that are worth so much. Also, for some reason, God made most common stones unattractive. Yet he made most rare stone very, stones very beautiful and brilliant and lustrous. The virtuous woman is a beautiful woman. Not necessarily outwardly, but certainly inwardly. As it says in Proverbs 31.30. She is not only a rare gem, but a beautiful gem. A godly woman is rare and very far hard to find. The same thing could be said about the godly man in Psalm 12.1. Help, Lord, for the godly man ceases, for the faithful disappear from among the sons of men. You know, there are hardly any such creatures around anymore. And a few that do exist will eventually die out. Pray that God in his infinite grace and mercy be pleased to raise up more godly men and women in these difficult and trying days. Pious in the Latin word for godly, or it is in the Latin word for godly, pious men, synonyms for pious or devout, devoted, dedicated, reverent, spiritual, prayerful, and holy. So if a young man is looking for a godly woman, how can he find her? First, he should trust God to find her for him. Second, he needs to realize that the virtuous woman isn't, isn't going to want just any man. She is going to want a virtuous man, a man of strength, a man seeking truth, a godly servant of Christ. This is not a physical strength but strength of character. So men, if you want any chance of finding a gem, you have to be a gem yourself. Take on the cloak of godliness. Learn the fear of the Lord. Dare to be different from the world. Dare to go against the flow of the world to be transformed by the renewing of the mind, as it tells us in Romans 12 too. Be the kind of man that would attract the interest of a godly woman. So in this opening verse, we have learned that the godly woman is very hard to find. She is more valuable than a rare gem. She has the inner beauty and a strength of character and moral firmness that is lacking in a vast majority of women, even believing women. And then in verse 11a here, it says, the heart of her husband safely trusts her. You know, sad to say, this can't be said for most humans today, or most husbands today. They can't trust their wives, and often their wives can't trust them. The ability of being able to find, truly trust your marriage partner is one of fundamental foundations of a strong God-honoring marriage. Martin Luther said of his wife, the greatest gift of God is a pious, amiable spouse who fears God, loves his house, with whom he can live in perfect confidence. The term husband is a common word for a husband in the Old Testament. It also means lord or owner. There are two reasons why the heart of the husband can trust his virtuous wife. The first reason is found in the second part of this verse. So he will have no lack of gain. The second reason is found in verse 12. She does him good and not evil. Which brings up 11b here. So he will have no lack of gain. No lack here is the same expression found in Psalm 23, 1, where it is used in the negative. I shall not want. If the Lord is my shepherd, then I shall not be in need, because he will supply all of my need. If I have a godly wife, I will not in be in need of gain. The word gain means plunder, booty, or spoil. It is often used of booty obtained by following, by following a battle, and victorious soldiers would take anything valuable from their defeated foes, and thus gain riches from the battle. 
That was part of the reward. Here in Hebrews 31.11, the word carries a secondary meaning of gain. It is not suggesting that if his wife were virtuous that she would need to go to battle, slay the enemy, and take their spoil. He shall have no need of gain because his wife is a tremendous benefit to the family, even financially. She's not a financial liability, as the verse is falling that will imply and illustrate. She manages the, to the home so well that she is so industrious and productive that her efforts result in great gain and even profit. Sadly, today, some wives are so thoughtful and careless that they cause the family to suffer great financial loss. They go on shopping sprees or incur immense credit card debt or waste countless hours each week, engage in unproductive activities like television and things like that. How can her husband safely trust her? After she has finished destroying the family budget, he has great need of gain in considering that she all the things that she's lost. Of course, the problem of wasteful spending and unproductive activities is not limited to women only. Men are at fault as well. In Proverbs in, uh, verse 12a, she does him good and not evil. Her husband can safely trust her because he doesn't need to worry about her being a financial liability in verse 11 and because he knows that she will do him only good and not evil. Proverbs 18.22 said, He who finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains favor from the Lord. You know, of course, the man needs to find the right kind of wife. Job's wife was a curse who only added to his trials in Job's 2, 9 through, 9 through 10. Some men in fine a crown to their head, while others find rottenness to their bones, as it says in Proverbs 12, 4. One of these reasons Proverbs 31, 10 through 31 was written, no doubt, is, is, is a helping guide to men in finding the right kind of wife. That's what the mom was telling the son. Some, of, some see Proverbs 31, 10 through 31 as a continuation of what King Enmul's mother taught him in Proverbs 31, 1 through 9. We just got through studying that. Concluding with this description of an ideal wife for her royal son. Now the key to finding the right woman is to look to the Lord in prayer and steadfast trust, so that God himself might be the one who finds her. God knows who my wife, my life partner should be. The verb do here is interesting. It's not the common Hebrew word for do, it means to deal out, to deal fully, to deal bountifully. At times it even approaches the meaning of to reward, to pay back. And it's illustrated in 1 Samuel 24, 17. David had just spared Saul's life, even though he easily could have killed his persecutor. Saul's response to that was, You are more righteous than I, for you have rewarded we with good, whereas I have rewarded you with evil. Saul deserved evil, but David dealt with him good in a good way. Saul dished out evil to David and evil and David dished out good to Saul, who actually deserved evil. In Genesis 50, 15 and 17, the term is used of Joseph's guilty brothers who remembered what they had done to Joseph. Where it says, perhaps Joseph will hate us it may actually repay us for the evil in which we did to him. Thus you shall say to Joseph, I beg you, please forgive the trespass of your brothers and their sin, for they did evil to you. They dealt out and dished out evil to Joseph, Joseph, but he didn't pay them back in the same way. Joseph saw goods 
God's good and sovereign and in all of it. In Genesis 50, Genesis 50, 20. The verb also is used of the Lord who deals bountifully with his servants. In Psalms 13, 6 and 116, 7 and 119, 17, 142, 7. The virtuous woman deals out to her husband that, that which is good. She dishes out to him and serves him that which is good and not evil. She wants only God's highest and best for him. Her life and her deeds are a constant benefit and blessing to her husband. And then in verse 12b, all the days of her life. In doing good to her husband, she's consistent. She doesn't serve him that what is good one day and that which is evil the next day. Her husband can counter her to do him good and be a blessing to him, always. He can count her to do this today, five days from now, one year from now, ten years from now, all the days of her life. She is not up and down, hot and cold. Her godliness is marked with consistency. And then in verse 13, she seeks wool and flax and willingly works with her hands. Wool, of course, was the wavy or curly undercoat of the sheep which can be woven into warm garment or fabric. Even today we wear wool sweaters and mittens to protect us from the cold. Flax was a fibrous plant that was used in spinning. The fibers can be drawn out and twisted into yarn or thread for the manufacture of linen. The most famous flax was grown under the ideal conditions in Egypt. There was no better linen than the fine linen of Egypt. That's one reason why the seventh plague was so terrible. The judgment involved uh, hailstones mixed with fire. The hailstones destroyed every herb in the field in Exodus 9.25 totally destroying, among other things, the flax crop. From flax can be made a variety of materials, including coarse canvas, rugged sails for ships, and even thin, delicate scarves. It's amazing material. The godly woman seeks wool and flax, these two basic materials to use in making clothes and garments. The term seek, uh, could mean that she selects, in the NIV, the best quality of wool and flax, or it could mean that she seeks with care or cares for the wool and flax. The word has this latter meaning in Deuteronomy 11:12, where it says, A land which the Lord thy God careth for, seeks. She carefully collects and gathers and cares for the wool and the flax that she will use in making clothes for her household and perhaps for others as well. And willingly works with her hands. The word willingly is from the word meaning delight or pleasure. She, take, she takes great uh, delight in her work. Rather than being a laborious and boring chore, it's a pleasant an enjoyable chore. Toil doesn't need to be tedious. It can be a tremendous source of pleasure and satisfaction. You know, when I was a little boy, my dad wasn't around and my mother worked all day to support us, me and my little sister. She was a cook, but she didn't stop working when she cared, came home. She cared for me and my little sister also. Often she couldn't afford to buy school clothes, so she would get out of her old sewing machine and make us school clothes. As she worked on the machine, you know, it's one of those old ones that you pedal with your feet. They're, they're still around, some of them. I could see the concentration on her face, but I could also see the joy in her eyes as she took great satisfaction in what she was doing. Working with her hands, she loved to do that especially for her kids. 
what she was doing for, for us was pleasant and enjoyable to her. For her, it was a source of pleasure and satisfaction. That's what it's talking about here. You know, in our modern computerized electronic entertainment saturated society, we have lost the art of working with our hands, haven't we? Most women don't delight in making clothes with their hands. Instead, they delight in shopping for clothes at the mall and thus adversely affecting the family budget. Instead of learning from their mothers how to sew and knit and crochet and mend, many children are too busy watching television and playing computer games. Unfortunately, most mothers don't even know how to do these things and couldn't teach the children if they wanted to. I used to watch my mother spend countless hours knitting and crocheting and sewing, but these things are becoming a lost start nowadays. Mothers and wives who are not seamstresses may be able to exchange skills that they do have for skills of those who sew a barter, a trade. There are times when it may be more economical in both time and money to wisely shop for bargains than to purchase items like material zippers and so forth. The wise woman uses her time and individual resources in the best way that she can. The godly woman takes great pleasure in working with her hands and providing clothing for her family. And then in verse 14, she says, or it says, she is like the merchant ships. She brings her food from afar. Now in verse 13, she is seeking to provide clothing for her family. In verse 14, she is seeking to provide food for her family. The Bible teaches us that with food and raiment, we can be content in 1 Timothy 6.8. And a virtuous woman plays a key role as God's in instrument in providing both. Notice the simile here. The virtuous woman is compared to the merchant ships. Merchants were, you know, are traders who buy or sell commodities for profit. And merchant ships are filled with items from far countries. So the godly woman brings food in from afar, from distant places. The word food here for the common Hebrew word is bread, but it's also used of food in general. Does this mean that she travels to far off countries to get international de delicacies for their family? That's not likely. It probably means that she brought in foods from distant lands by trading for them. She took some of the wondrous garments and clothes that she made with her hands in verse 13 and was able to bring them to some merchant men and trade them for food items which had come from afar, even from distant lands. Today the wife usually says to her husband, dear, I need some money because I'm going to go to town and do our weekly grocery shopping. Virtuous woman said, dear, I'm going to town, but I don't need any money because I'm taking some of these fine linen which I've made and will trade for some of the items of which you will really enjoy. He can't complain about that, can he? It also seems that she recognized that it would be good for her family to give them great variety in their diet, including international dishes, and not to constantly give them the same foods all the time. Variety is the spice of life. In verse 15, she also rises while it is yet night and provides food for her household and a portion for her maidservants. She is up before the sun, showing that idleness and laziness have no place with her. We can compare that to verse 27. The sluggard in Proverbs 6, 6 through 11 should not only go to the ant, but should go to the virtuous woman to learn a lesson of diligence. There are great benefits to rising early. You know, it's a quiet time from the noise and distractions of the day. It's an ideal time to spend with the Lord in quiet meditation and prayer, starting the day with Him. 
We also see this principle in the manna which God provided for the children in Israel in the wilderness. Manna had to be gathered anew every morning in Exodus 16, 14 through 22. Just as fresh food for our souls is needed each day in the morning. We have the example of our blessed Lord. Now in the morning, having risen a long while before daylight, he went out and he parted to a solitary place. And there he prayed in Mark 135. The psalmist was in a habit of morning prayer. In the morning, my prayer comes before you in Psalm 18 or 88, 13. Rising up early also allows us to get a good start on the day. If a person sleeps in late, by the time he really gets going, more, you know, half the day could have been gone. He has very little time to accomplish anything. Sprinters know the most important part of a race is how they get the start of the race, how they get off in the starting blocks. That's how we start our days. The key here is beginning well. May God help us to start our days well, beginning the day with God and getting up good and early start on the tasks and duties that demand our attention and diligence. You know, needless to say, a mother may have to sleep in after being up during the night with a sick child. The virtuous woman is diligent, yet flexible and realistic. Then she provides food for her household and a portion for her maidservants. You know, one of the reasons she rises up so early is to provide food for her household. When the father and children get up, they are greeted with a hearty home-cooked breakfast. Nutrition is considered breakfast the most important meal of the day, nourishing the body that has not had any food for many hours, the breaking of fast, that is breakfast, and providing energy for the toll of the day. The virtuous woman makes sure that her family gets off to a good nutritional start. This word, word food, food here, translated by some as game, is also used in uh, Psalms 111, 111 5 of God's gracious provision of food for those who fear Him. Young women today, in many cases, hardly know how to prepare meals. Many families eat out frequently and order food that can be brought into the home. How many families take the time to sit down at a meal together around the table? You know, often families don't eat together, don't pray together, don't read together, and as a result, don't stay together. Her maidens are her female servants. The virtuous woman was blessed with a large household that included female maids or servants. She didn't live in poverty. This was a well-to-do family. We're reminded that under the Old Testament economy, the Israelites who honored and feared the Lord were promised not only spiritual blessings, but also material blessings. And certainly the women described in Proverbs 31 had both. One might think that this virtual woman could command her female servants and tell them to rise up early and prepare breakfast meal and have it ready for her entire family. But we are told here that she gives a portion to her maidens. She did it. Not only does this speak of her kindness to those working under her, but it also indicates that she abandoned of others only what she herself was willing to do. An example for her workers. Workers and servants will greatly respect a superior who is willing to get his hands dirty and do some of the very tasks which we might require of them. The term portion here is used in a wonderful passage found in Job 23.12, where it says, I have not departed from the commandment of his lips. I have treasured the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. And then in verse 16, she considers a field of bicep, 
from her prophets she plants a vineyard. The word considers is from a verb which is often used to describe the wicked who devise evil or actively plotting evil. Some examples might be the wicked plots against the just and gnashes at him with her teeth, with his teeth, in Psalms 37, 12. While they take counsel together against me, they scheme to take away my life, in Psalm 31, 13b. Now nothing that they propose to do will we be withheld from them, in Genesis 11, 6b. In this passage, a people of Babel considered in their minds all kinds of evil, and their evil plots would have come to fruition if God hadn't confused their tongues and scattered them about. In Psalm 17, 3, the same verb is used to determine a course of action. I have purposed that my mouth shall not transgress. When a wicked man devised evil, and they often will put on a lot of thought and planning into it. We can think of a horrific terrorist attacks against the World Trade Center and the Pentagon in 9-11. These successful attacks were the fruit of enormous planning and premeditation. It was carefully thought out. It was a carefully thought out operation. The godly woman considers a field, a plot of land in open country. She doesn't do this rashly or on a sudden impulse, but she is giving very careful thought to the matter. She has a plan for her family. She carefully thinks what she needs. She decides that a prosperous vineyard would be beneficial to all, and thus she decides, decides upon a field that would be suitable. She buys it. Literally here, she takes it. She acquires the field, probably by purchasing it. The fact that she buys a field indicates that the godly woman was involved in financial decisions relating to the family and involved in financial transactions. From what we know about this godly woman, she didn't act independently of her husband. We know that the heart of her husband did safely trust her in verse 11 which would not be the case if his wife were running around purchasing all kinds of things without his knowledge. The godly wife, under the headship of her husband, can play a significant role in managing family finances. Some wives are very good at keeping a checkbook and managing a family budget, and it would be to the advantage of the family for the husband to delegate this responsibility to her. Husbands, your wife should be involved in financial decisions. How many women buy all kinds of things on a spur of the moment without giving the matter careful thought and deliberation? As she races out to the shopping mall with her friends, can her husband safely trust in her? You know, we might also ask, can the wife trust her husband when he goes shopping? We make decisions together, is what we do. We make decisions together. Then it says, from her prophet, she plants a vineyard. In the King James Version, with the fruit of her hands, she planteth a vineyard. The prophets would be from the fruit of her hands. The purpose of the field was to provide a place for, the, for a vineyard that the family and others can enjoy the fruit of the vine. The fruit of her hands signifies the result of her labor. To cultivate a field, to maintain a vineyard, requires a lot of labor. The vineyard was the fruit of her loving toil. Before we buy something, we need to count the cost. Before we buy a field, we need to ask, am I willing to work the field? Many things that we purchase require a good bit of maintenance, and if we are unwilling to provide the labor that is needed for the maintenance, then the purchase is probably unwise, isn't it? Think of people who rashly procure a pet, 
not considering all the time and effort that is required to properly take care of the animal. When the godly woman planned for the purchase of the field, she also calculated the amount of toil that would be needed to maintain the vineyard. The fruit of her hands could also be understood another way as the fruit of her earnings. That is, with the fruit of her hands, in verse 13, she was able to earn enough money to purchase and plant a vineyard. Maybe she employed her servants, her maidens, in verse 15, to work the field to help her or to help her work the field. And then verse 17, it says she girds herself with strength and strengthens her arms. King James Version says she girdeth her loins with strength and strengtheneth her arms. In her strength and a tenacious trust in God translateth to outer strength and physical vitality and vigor. The loins are regarded as the seat of strength in 1 Kings 12.10 and Nahum 2.1. The term refers to the abdominal or hip region of the body, the midsection, the region of strength and procreative power. To gird means to encircle or bind with a flexible band or girdle or belt. In Bible times, both men and women wore outer robes or tunics. You know, if a tunic was ungirded, it would, be, it would interfere with the person's ability to walk freely. The Bible often makes symbolic use of the girdle. Jesus said, let your loins be girded about in Luke 12, 35. In other words, be as men who have a long race to run. Gather up the folds of your flowing robes and fasten them with your girdle. That nothing may keep you back or impede your steps. In Bible language, to be girded means to be ready for action. For you have armed me with the strength of the battle, as it says in Psalm 1839. So the virtuous woman has a reservoir of inner strength, which is able to energize her and enable her to accomplish physical tasks which require a great amount of physical strength. She isn't weakened by sloth and laziness, but she is a wonderful example of diligence and industry. George Lawson describes her in this way. George Lawson is a Bible commentator. As rust gathers on the metals that are seldom used, so sluggishness of disposition contracts a rust on the powers of the body and the mind. And idle persons, by degrees, realize those excuses for their conduct, which were at first mere shams. The virtuous woman is of diligent temper, or different temper. She declines not any part of her duty through aversion to toil, but by exerting her strength with a cheerful mind, she improves it. Her labors give her health and vigor and alacrity for new labors so that she can, with great ease and tranquility, go through those duties which appear impossibilities to other women. The Lord strengthens her in her, dilig in her diligence to succeed for her family. We'll continue with this in verse 18 next week. Make sure you tune in. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this time. We pray that you write these words on our hearts, Lord. If there's things here we need to be using, or there, you know, if we need to be drawing closer to you, Lord, if we need to be relying on your diligence and what you give to us, the strength that you give to us, Lord, to be virtuous men and women, we pray that you put that on our hearts, Lord. And give us the strength to, to be obedient to you, Lord, to follow you more closely. We thank you for these words, Lord. We pray that you continue to teach us next week, Lord, with these teachings of the virtuous woman. We love you and we praise you in Jesus' name.
Amen. Thank you, beloved. I'll see you next week.